Just praise Him. I love you today, oh God. I thank you, Lord, for healing, Lord, that you gave us last week. I thank you, Lord, for deliverance, oh God, that you provide for us, oh Jesus. You are our restorer, God. You're such an amazing God. Lord, I want to worship you, Jesus. I praise your name, God. For you are good, Lord. You are good, Jesus. Hallelujah.
greatness. Come on, lift your voice according to his greatness. Lord, we worship you, Lord, from a purified heart. Lord, we worship you, Jesus. Lord, I praise your name, oh God. Hallelujah. Jesus, you're the 
see you face to face, oh God. To worship you, I live. To worship you.
I wonder if all across the room we could just lift our hands for just a moment. Thanking Him for His presence that we feel in this house. In the precious name of Jesus. God, we thank You, Lord. We thank You, Lord. We thank You, Lord. God, we've come to worship and magnify You, Lord, because You alone are worthy. Come to magnify You, Lord Jesus. come to give him all of the glory and all of the honor and when we worship the precious name of Jesus he steps into the room anybody feel the presence of the Lord here today amen God bless you you can be seated this morning just for a moment and I'm going to take care of a couple of things here this morning and then get right into the word what an honor to have Everyone here today, our guests, uh, if you're a guest here today, we thank you for taking time to be with us today and uh, are honored by your presence. And, uh, as of Easter Sunday, it's been official now that we're live stream all the time. And so there's probably somebody watching from who knows where. Uh, but we're thankful for all that are in attendance with us here today, whether in person or uh, via the internet we're thankful to have you here today welcome to the house of the Lord we're honored by your presence to be here today amen it's good to have sister McBroom here with us brother Scott's mom good to have her here visiting with us amen came all the way up from Jacksonville Florida just to hear me preach today I'm so blessed it might have something to do with those grandkids I know it doesn't have anything to do with, with brother Scott so <clears throat> but it's to have her here with us today. What a powerful service we had last weekend, Sunday morning, Sunday night, even continued on into Sunday night. What, a, what an awesome presence of the Lord that we had in here. God touched. We had healings take place. We had spiritual breakthroughs that took place last weekend. Just what a tremendous move and presence of God. And uh, it's no different this weekend, uh, just because it's maybe a different mode, the same presence, same power, same anointing. Uh, same everything still here this weekend also and it's here Tuesday night when we came for prayer it was here and so the presence of God uh, just continues to rest but uh, last weekend I had a matter of fact I got a text message this morning uh, from a, a friend of ours that lives over in Missouri and uh, actually I met him through uh, just a chain of events God actually had put together and I met him and uh, he was actually a backslider at the time when I met him and we didn't talk for just a couple of minutes and he looked at uh, Sister C and I, and he said, he said, you're apostolics, aren't you? And I said, yes, sir, we are. And uh, we got to talking and found out he was actually a backslider out of a church, out of a uh, Pentecostal church. And um, as we talked a little bit more, uh, we just created a friendship. And I tried to keep communication with him. And uh, he ended up back in church and texted me one day, said, I'm going back to church. My family's back in church. We prayed back through. I'm back playing the drums in church. All this kind of stuff that happened. And... And, and God's just tremendous in how he uses in different, you never know. You just never know how God's going to use you. And, and so this has been several years now. We've stayed in communication and he just, he had texted me not too long ago and told me that his mother-in-law was uh, not doing well. And, you know, not many people want to pray for their mother-in-law, but um, he did. I might, I would, but I, some others have that situation, but, uh, but he wanted prayer for his mother-in-law. She had cancer and they told her that the doctors had given her a 7% chance of living. And, uh, she, uh, was going through, you know, the situation as we understand with cancer and that was kind of rocking the whole family. And he just called me. He said, I just had to call you cause I know that you'll pray. Uh, I know that your church will pray. I know that you have people that will pray. And, and so we, we, we prayed for him and I stayed in communication. He texted me this morning and he said, I just wanted to let you know, he said that she went back to the doctor just this past week and they can't find any traces of any cancer in her body whatsoever. So I know I serve a God that's a healer. Amen. And his, his final statement was 7% is an awful lot for God to work with. 
And uh, so we're thankful for the presence of God and how he touches. But last weekend, uh, not only did he heal and not only did other things happen, but we also had uh, some baptisms and uh, some folks get the Holy Ghost for the first time. And so uh, Sister Megan Grooms last Sunday morning got baptized and got the Holy Ghost. Amen. Congratulations. And then not to be outdone, he got the Holy Ghost about a month or so ago, but last Sunday got baptized. Brother Earl Grooms got baptized. And and then just decided to have himself a little Holy Ghost time while he was in the tank. So, So thankful for what God is doing in their lives and so thankful for how he's touching. We're going to go before the Lord in for prayer in just a moment uh, as we get started here this morning, but I need to do something here today, and I, if I tell you that I'm uncomfortable in doing this, I need you to understand how uncomfortable I really am, because uh, I don't like doing stuff like this, uh, but <clears throat> I do need to ask a favor. Uh, over the last uh, eight years, we have had this uh, projector that we have above us, and uh, it's done a good job for us for the last eight years, but uh, it's on its last leg. It's crutching along. You don't know this, but we come in here on Sunday mornings and turn it on and things will be going goofy with it and it won't work. It'll be upside down. It'll be uh, having different issues. And uh, Brother Brandon, if you'll put something up on the screen for me, because right now it looks really bad. Hey, that's my title this morning. I didn't know you were going to put that up, but <clears throat> yeah, that's okay. You got it there now. Go ahead and leave it <laughs> or throw the scriptures up. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> if you'll, if you look at it this morning and, and it's, it's much dimmer, if you just take a quick glance to the one on the back wall and see the difference in the picture, um, you can tell that it's, it's going. Eight years ago when we bought this, it was top of the line, state of the art. It was the best thing going at the time. Uh, but as you know, in electronics, things go out quickly and uh, it's really on its last leg. And we have done a lot of research, a lot of hunting uh, to try to get something equivalent to that today. Uh, would cost us somewhere about $3,500, uh, but we have done some uh, shopping. Brother Scott has been tirelessly trying to find and make people honor deals and match pricing and do all that kind of thing and been able to get us down to a projector that's twice the lumens. What that means is the brightness, twice the brightness of the one that we currently have uh, and got it down to $1,800. So he's done a tremendous job. I'm, I'm glad you're thankful. Here's where the uncomfortable part comes in for me. I need to take up a special offering this morning to uh, purchase this. This is something that, you know, I don't think needs to just come out of the general budget. I think we could just put together real quick here and, and take care of this and get it ordered and get it up and have it looking uh, much, much better. And so I'm not going to collect it from you today unless you want to. I'm going to give you till the end of the month. But here's what I am going to ask. I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot. And I've got Brother Robinson back there. Of course, he's been teaching on giving uh, the last two Wednesday nights. And uh, we've already had testimonies come in from people who have enacted what he's already been teaching. And they've already had tremendous testimonies that have come in. But here's what I'm going to ask you. If you can help us uh, with $50 or $100, and you don't have to bring it to us till the end of the month. You've got until the end of the month to do it. Uh, If you can help us with that, I'm asking you to stand. I'm putting you on the spot. Stand with me. If you can help us with 50 or 100, Brother Jeff, just count real quick. He's trying to take names. We've got it on camera right now. If those in the video room, (laughs) Brother Andrew's on camera, just scan the audience right now. We see everybody who's standing. Thank you so very, very much. I didn't want to take time out to do it, but I think it'll take care of it. All I need you to do is when you write a check or if you put it in an envelope, just please make sure that you notate for new projector and uh, we'll get that. I think by looking at this, Brother Robinson, we'll just go ahead and order it tomorrow morning and get it on its way here. Thank you so very much. God bless you. You can be seated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sacrifice for the kingdom of God. And uh, it just makes things better around here. You ever notice when we have to try to watch a video or show you something, you can't see the picture and we got to shut all the lights down just to be able to see it. That's, that's the reason why um, it's getting old as we do and our eyes grow dim and all of that kind of stuff. And so uh, same thing is happening there. Amen. So, I didn't kill the spirit. Everybody's good, right? It's the spirit of giving is all part of it. It's all part of the kingdom of God. And so, thank you for your sacrifice. And so now, if you'll get your Bibles and turn to Numbers chapter 13. 
and stand with me one more time. We are going to pray and then we're going to read some scripture here this morning and then you can be seated. But I want you to keep your Bibles open because I'm going to continue to reference some uh, scripture here today. But I want us to pray before we do that. We need to remember uh, Sister Tina Turner's uncle uh, passed away last night, Billy Bingham in Alabama. And so let's remember him uh, this morning. Also continue to remember those that are sick. Sister Nellie Jones is uh, back in the hospital. We visited with her uh, on Friday. And so make sure that you keep them in your prayers uh, continue to remember uh, Carly, Marley's uh, little girl, and, and continue to remember Peyton, uh, Sister DePriest's nephew also that God would touch, and uh, Brother Ron Sifford's brother. We've been praying for him, and he told me he's doing better this morning, and so we just want God to continue to touch uh, in a tremendous way. Uh, also, Tyler Vickers, this is Sister Marilyn's uh, grandson, was in a motorcycle accident on Friday, Thursday. And uh, he's had to go in for some surgeries uh, on his foot. He basically crushed his ankle and broke his foot in about four places and uh, lost a lot of blood. But infection has been setting in, so they've had to go back in. And they're looking at having to do the surgery again, maybe tomorrow. And so uh, we're going to pray for him also. We want God to touch that uh, in Jesus' name. I believe that God can do it. Amen. After what happened around here last weekend, you ought to believe pretty much in just about anything God can do. <laughs> Amen. And so let's pray and ask God to touch us here this morning, touch his word here today uh, that's anointed that we would receive it and touch these needs here today. Lord, in your precious name, God, we love you today. God, we are so honored, God, by your presence, God, that we feel in this house, and it truly is as close as we can get to heaven, God, having your presence in our midst. And God, we thank you, Lord, for how you have touched. And God, we bring these names before you, God. You see the needs, God. And we pray right now under the authority of the mighty name of Jesus, God, that you will touch those needs here today. God, let healing virtue flow. God, even from this room right now, God, I pray that you would touch by the powerful name of Jesus. God, I pray, Lord, that you'll touch us today, God. I pray, Lord, that you'll anoint our ears to hear, God, our hearts to receive. God, I pray, Lord, that your word that is anointed go forth and do what it's been sent to do. And God, we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Let's read in Numbers chapter 13, uh, verse number 24 through 33, a very familiar portion of Scripture. <clears throat> and then I'm just going to get right into it today. If you'll uh, just jump on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach fast so you listen, listen quick, okay? All right, I lost some of you already. Numbers chapter 13, verse number 24. It says, the place was called the Valley of Eshel because of the cluster which the men of Israel cut down there. And they returned from spying. Again, I'm reading from New King James Version, but it says they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. Verse 26, now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh and brought back word to the children of Israel. And them and among all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then, verse 27, understand now they're bringing back these big grapes. Two guys are carrying it. It's huge stuff. They're bringing back and showing them all of this fruit of the land. In verse 27, then they told him uh, and said, we went to the land where you sent us. And truly, uh, it flows with milk and honey and it, this is its fruit. And then verse 28, nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. And the Amalekites dwell in the land in the south, and the Hittites, and the Jezebites, and the Amorites, and all the ites, and the Canaanites, and the dwell in the mountains, and, and they dwell in the sea, and the banks of Jordan. All the ites were there. And verse number 30 says this. Then Caleb. They bring us the fruit, say, hey, look, this is what we can have. Look how wonderful this is, but... Let me explain something to you. There's big folks there and we don't want to mess with them. But then Caleb says, he quieted the people before Moses and he said, let us go up at once and take possession for we are well able to overcome it. He said, quit your whining. Let's go get it right now. Right now is the appointed time. We don't need to wait. God said it's ours. But then verse 31, but the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against this people for they are stronger than we. And verse 32, and they gave the children of Israel a bad report. There's always going to be somebody around to tell you something negative. Hey, the children of Israel, whoa, let me just back up for just a second. Man, this just hit me. This is straight from God. You ready? Even the people that were in the church were given a bad report. Wow. Even the ones 
that went in and saw the blessing of El. Okay. <clears throat> and they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying the land uh, through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. Wow. And all the people whom we saw there are men of great stature. Key verse here, number 33. Then we saw the giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. We were grasshoppers in our own sight. And so, because that's the way we were in our own sight, that obviously must be the way that we are in their sight. Turn around to somebody next to you before you see it and say, you need a new pair of shades. Huh. Amen. Vision. Vision is important. Anybody agree with that? Vision is important. Glasses have been developed to help correct vision. Uh, Sister C is... Uh, been blessed to have had surgery on her eyes so that she can see now. But prior to that surgery, she was blind as a bat. She could get on one side of the bed and have to crawl over me to see the clock that the numbers are this big on. And try to read what it was. And so having that has obviously helped her. But she had glasses before that were thick. She wore contacts because she didn't want you to see the Coke bottles that she had that she wore. Uh, and, and so I inherited uh, a blind a uh, sweetheart of mine that I love so very, very much that's now been healed and touched and blessed and made her just all the better. I just love her. I told her the other day, yesterday we were talking about the beautiful eyes and uh, I won't get sappy on you, but I'm just so thankful for her. But it was important to have good vision. I'm trying to dig my way out of this. Ain't nobody helping me. <clears throat> but glasses are absolutely important. There was a hostess uh, that was at the, a buffet and, and showed this lady to her table, and uh, the lady asked her to keep an eye out for her husband. She said, I need you to watch for my husband. He'll be joining me momentarily, and she began to describe him. She said, he has gray hair, he wears glasses, and has a pot belly. <laughs> At that point, the hostess stopped her, and she said, honey, she said, today's senior day. They all look like that. <laughs> <clears throat> so it's obviously important that we have good vision and clarify Medical transcription makes errors. As a matter of fact, to paraphrase Mark Twain, he said, be careful of medical transcripts. Uh, you may die of a misprint. <laughs> and there was a, a, one that said, social history reveals that this one-year-old patient does not smoke or drink and is presently unemployed. <laughs> Another one said, on the second day, the knee was better. On the third day, it disappeared. <laughs> medical transcripts can kill you. Another one that said discharge status, alive but without permission. <laughs> there was another one that stated occasional, constant, infrequent headaches. I think that's me sometimes. And then the last one said that she is numb from her toes down. <clears throat> okay. So be careful. Make sure somebody can read that stuff real well. And glasses are important to make sure that happens. Vision is absolutely important. As a matter of fact, we, we also wear sunglasses. Most all of us probably have a pair of sunglasses. We use them to protect our eyes. And, and uh, I don't know about you, but if I bought an expensive pair of sunglasses, I can't keep them. I lose them within a few days, break them, uh, do something with them within a few days. But if I buy a cheap pair, I can't lose them. I could drop them in the lake, go back three weeks later, and they'd still be floating in the same spot. You can't lose a cheap pair of sunglasses. So don't waste your money on, a, on an expensive pair because you'll lose them. You'll break them. But there's all types of sunglasses. There's anti-glare, and there's scratch-resistant, and there's polarized, and there's transition lenses, and there's bifocals, and some even have trifocals. <laughs> And so you have all these different types of glasses and obviously the importance of vision and how important it is to have these, these glasses. But what, what I need you to see in this, this story this morning is that the children of Israel couldn't see the results of a promise or they could see the results of a promise, but they couldn't believe the promise. The results were the fruit and the land flowing with milk and honey, but they, they couldn't believe in the promise. It, it, as a matter of fact, they felt better and safer with living in their problem rather than possessing their promise. Let that catch on for just a second. 
They felt better and felt safer with living in their problem rather than possessing the promise that God had made them. God had made them a promise and they had seen the fruits of the promise and yet they were still unwilling to trust him to deliver the land that, they had, that he had told them he would give. God had already, please understand, brought them through so much. God had already carried them through. So, anybody, God's brought you out of some things in your life. He, he's already he had already carried the children of, children of Israel through so many things. He, he, they escaped from Egypt and Pharaoh. What a mass exodus that was. And they crossed over the Red Sea on dry ground. And they were fed quail and manna every day. They were even given water from a rock. All of these things were given to him. All of these things were supplied to him. Yet God had already done so much for him, but they still couldn't trust him. They still couldn't trust what he had said. And we, we all know people that make promises to you. And you know the moment that that promise left their lips, it wasn't real and wasn't actually going to come to pass. Like your children who said, I promise. I'm going to clean my room. You know before the words got out of their mouth, that ain't happening unless you're dragging them down there and watching them do it. Okay? Not any of our children here, but in other places that I've been, children do things like that. Not here, of course. But there's people we know that the moment they make the promise, you know good and well they're not going to come through with it. But what has God done for us? What has God brought us through? Let me ask you, has God ever failed us? Has God ever failed? Somebody said, God's not failed me yet. Well, quit saying yet because he's not going to. Quit waiting on the time when God fails. God's not going to fail. If he hasn't failed me today, he's not going to fail me tomorrow. If he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, then he's not going to fail me. Quit waiting on it and expecting that it's going to happen. And, and, and the record that he has, uh, there's no doubt that he will never fail us when we look at his record. But here's the problem, and I, I don't understand why this is the case, but we can trust the banker. We can trust the mechanic. Listen, I, I, I took my vehicle to two different, three different mechanics. They kept telling me my problem was catalytic converters. My truck had no power. It was catalytic converter. I should have that piece right now to show you. It was catalytic converters. And I went and replaced catalytic converters. That's not cheap. I got upset with Ford because they wouldn't pay for it. And, and so I had to go pay to have them replaced. And you know, I got them replaced and my truck did the same thing. I trusted this guy. This is going to be what fixes it. And so I took it back again. Somebody had to literally take the front of my truck apart. And you know what they found? They found a piece of foam that was over the intake where the air couldn't get in and nobody has a clue where the foam came from. I didn't need catalytic converters. Hmm. He is lucky I got the Holy Ghost. That's all I can tell you. Boy, that's a message in and of itself. There was that blockage in the air path where I couldn't get any power. Because Wow, man, write that down. Make a note of that. That's a good message right there. So we trust the banker. We trust the mechanic. We trust the doctors. We trust the newspaper. Dear God, we trust the weatherman. You'll plan an event based on what the weatherman told you. We even trust politicians. <laughs> and they always do what they say they're going to do. <laughs> I've told you before, I know we're getting on election season. I told you what politics means. And so just make sure you keep that in mind. Poly comes from the root word meaning many. And every one of us know what a tick is. <laughs> so... Many blood-sucking insects, that's all it is, politics. But God has never made a mistake. I get more out of that than I do anything else I've said. God has never made a mistake, and we still can't trust Him and the things that He has promised us. The problem with us is that we want to try to figure out how God's going to make the promise come to pass before we accept it. How is it going to work before I accept the promise? I'm sure that Moses was not sure how the whole prison break was going to happen, but he trusted God. Joshua probably laughed when he was told the plan of how to defeat Jericho, but it didn't stop him. 
Gideon probably had some men in his army that didn't agree with the battle plan that God had laid out for Gideon, but they yet still defeated the Midianites. As a matter of fact, David's brothers had already started writing a Dear John letter to their dad about how their brother got killed when he went out after a giant before he ever even stepped out on the ground. Even when the disciples prayed for the sick, there were those that did not think that it would be possible. But the Lord never told them or told them that they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. They didn't know what was going to happen. They just knew what God said. If I lay hands on the sick, they're going to recover. I just believe and trust God. When you're going to stop looking or when are you going to stop looking at what is not possible and start trusting God that he's going to provide the promises that he said he would. Quit looking at it and going, well, that's not possible. God can never do that. I'm telling you, if God said it's going to happen, it will happen. I don't care what you think. He never promised, the song says, that our cross wouldn't be heavy. He never promised that the hill would be easy to climb. He never promised that we would have victory without a battle. But he did promise that he would always be there to help us and carry us through. He'd never leave us. He'd never forsake us. So if he made us a promise, it's going to happen. We've got to get rid of a mentality that says our enemy is bigger than we are and we can't defeat them. You know what? They are maybe bigger than you are, but they're not bigger than your God is. That's what you have to understand. Here's what you have to understand. The enemy had never even seen them. They were spies. (laughs) Hello? The whole job of a spy is not to be seen. They were spies. The enemy hadn't even seen them. And they already had it figured out in their mind that they were going to lose just simply by looking at the battle that they would have to face. And the enemy hadn't even seen them yet. The problem was their vision was distorted. They were wearing some distorted glasses. They had some glasses that weren't real clear on their vision and how they're supposed to see. Now, if these aren't distorted, they're definitely distracting. They they had accepted the loss before the battle ever even started. Sometimes, let me just help you for a second. Our enemy needs to appear bigger than we are and appear bigger than what we can handle so that we remember that it was God that won the battle and not us. Sometimes the enemy needs to be something we can't get beyond or think that we can't conquer because I need to remember that it wasn't me, it was God that brought me out. I need to remember that it's not by my power, it's not by my might, but it's by His power and His might God brought me through. Make sure you're clapping because I can't tell. And so let me show you what happens here for just a second. Man, I don't even know if I can read with these things on. Let me show you what happens here for just a second. I got to keep them on to kind of keep the the idea here. So Numbers chapter 14. I got to get in between two lines right here. (laughs) Numbers chapter 14, verse number one through 12. Watch what this says. So I feel like Brother Hugh and I keep grabbing my glasses. (laughs) He's probably watching. (laughs) So all the congregation lifted up their voices and they cried and the people wept all night. They pouted all night long. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. They complained. Again, these are the church folks. They complained against the preacher. (laughs) And the whole congregation said to them, If we had died, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. Why? Has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should become victims? Would it not have been better to return to Egypt? Wow, I can't do that. And verse number four says this. So they said to one another, watch, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Get us a new leader. Because this guy's trying to follow after God. Woo. This guy's listening to what God is telling him. We need to find us a leader that'll listen to what we're telling him. Wow. 
Verse 5, then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all of the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But then look at verse 6. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jehanath, who were among those who had spied out the land, they tore their clothes in a, a repentant state. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying this, the land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. And then they said, if the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Verse 9, he said, only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. I mean, come on, it's a motivational speech that Joshua and Caleb are given. They're saying, listen, if God's promised it to us, it's going to happen. Quit being in fear. Quit worrying. Their protection, their defense is going to fall at the feet of God. But all of the children of Israel are like this. And here's their response. Here's what they said. Verse number 10. And all the congregation said, stone them. (laughs) Just get rid of those guys. Hang on a second. Get rid of any voice of prophecy in my life. Get rid of anything that's going to tell me that God will bring me out. And God will bring me through. If you're going to do that, you might as well get rid of the book. Because everywhere in the book, he says, I'm going to carry you through. I'm going to see you make it to the other side. It's going to be all right. We're going to make it. But I don't want to hear a voice in my life telling me that God's going to carry me. He said, stone them. The children of Israel said to stone them. They get up and give this great motivational speech. And then they they said, we need to stone them. It's because their vision was distorted. And then it says on in that verse, it says, Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the meeting before the children of Israel. And here's what the Lord said to Moses. How long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? Watch what he says, verse 12. I will strike them with the pestilence and to disinherit them. And I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. God said, how long am I going to listen to this? How long am I going to listen to people talk like this? How long after I've done so much for them, am I going to have to listen to people tell me that I can't do it? Then you skip down to verse number 26. And the Lord spake, spoke to Moses and to Aaron saying this again. How long shall I bear this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Verse 28. So he says, so say to them. Here's what I want you to tell them. Verse 29. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. Wow, maybe they didn't really mean that we'd be better off to die in the wilderness. Because he said, the carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who are numbered according to the entire number from 20 years old and above. Everybody from 20 years old and above are going to die in the wilderness. You shall by no means, verse 30, be no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. But your little ones whom you said would be victims, I will bring in and they shall not know the land which you have despised but as for you your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness but he made an exception in verse 30 the first half of it he said except for Caleb and Joshua he said all the rest of you from 20 years old and up are going to die in this wilderness. And let me just help you with something here just for a second. They were the ones complaining and saying, if we stay in this, if we do what God has told us to do, watch me, if we do the things that God has told us to do, our children are going to become victims. And God said, those of you who have complained against me, your children aren't going to be victims. They're going to inherit the promise that you didn't want. 
They're going to inherit the blessing that you didn't want. Listen to me real quick. Let me be pastor just for a second. You need to hear what I'm telling you. Don't ever complain against the house of God or the kingdom of God and say, I don't want my children to have to become one of those Christians. You better be careful in how you process that because God says you might die without it, but I'm still going to make the same promise to those kids that I have made to you. You may not want it, but they may want it. The problem is your vision is distorted. You don't see things the way that you should. Your vision has become distorted. And he said, don't you worry about any of these kids. Suffer these children to come unto me. Don't get worried about these kids being up here worshiping. Don't worry about them being up here praying. I know it may not be completely sincere in your eyes, but it is in their eyes. And when God sees it, he says, I'm making the same promise to them that I've made to you. Watch. If you don't want to come down and get a blessing, they will. Come on, I need somebody to help me here for just a minute. I need somebody to help me for just a moment. You need to quit questioning God and questioning what God has done for you and making your kids hear you question God. Don't ever let your children hear you question God. You, if you don't want the blessing, he'll give it to the next generation. He told him, he said, you'll die in this wilderness. Your carcasses are going to die. In this wilderness. The problem is they had the wrong kind of glasses. Their vision. Because remember they said we were as grasshoppers in what? In our own eyes. And so since we were in our own eyes, that must be the way we are in the enemy's eyes. But there was a difference There was a Joshua and Caleb who got them a new pair of shades. And they were looking at things totally different than everybody else was looking. They were looking at them differently. Huh? They began to look at it just a little bit differently than everybody else. When everybody else said we can't do it, Joshua and Caleb said, oh, yes, we can. When everybody else said I can't see it happening, they said I don't need to see it. I've got something in front of me that's going to help me make it through. I've got the Bible on my side. I'm going to look at it the way that God sees it. I'm going to look at it through his word. And when God says it can happen, it can happen. They got them a new pair of shades. (laughs) Here's what you need to understand. God can. You may not be able to see the other side of your struggle, but God can. The doctor may not be able to heal you, but God can. There may not be anyone to be a friend to you, but God can. You may not be able to get your peace back, but God can. You may not be able to get your joy back, somebody, but God can. You may not be able to get your strength back, but God can. You may not be able to get your mind back, but God can. You may not be able to get your family back, but God can. When are you going to realize God is bigger than your problem? Come on, why don't somebody clap their hands to the Lord for just a moment? Come on, somebody, why don't you celebrate for just a moment? Come on, get your old distracting glasses off. Get you a new pair of shades and put them on. Get you a new pair of shades. Get a new vision of what God can do. Whenever we realize that God is bigger than we could ever imagine and that the problems that we may have are nothing compared to God's ability, that's when we finally see that God can and will do all things. Why don't we stop trying to figure it out and start letting God handle it? Why don't you quit trying to figure it out and let God handle it? I want music to get ready. I got something I need to show you, okay? This is something I haven't seen. I'm getting close to closing. Nobody be nervous. Your roast will be all right. Here's what I need you to see in Scripture. There was two men, right, Joshua and Caleb, that said, we can do this. There was two guys that said, listen, y'all need to quit talking negative you need to understand that if God made us a promise we can do this I know the enemy looks bigger 
I know the adversary looks like they might have this wrapped up. I know that everything may look negative for us. But I'm just telling you that if God made me a promise, I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to take place. But I know that God will see through that it will happen. They had a new pair of shades on. They had a total different outlook than everybody else that was with them. They all saw the same fruit. They all saw the same milk and honey. They all saw the green fields. They all saw the blessings of that promise. They all saw the same thing. The problem is one of them was looking through some distorted glasses and the other ones had put on a new pair of shades. But here's what I need you to understand about these two men. You ready? I, I spent some time here looking into this and I, I, did, I didn't necessarily realize this. I preached this kind of stuff before, but I never really realized this until I, I looked at it closely. Caleb is one that came from the tribe of Judah. I started looking at all the different tribes and where these men came from. And when they started listing where these men came from, and you go back in Genesis and see what part of the tribes they were with. Caleb came from the tribe of Judah. Hmm. Judah means praise. Hang on. When you worship, when you praise, your faith is increased. You will always have faith in the victory when you have a voice of praise that gives credit to the one who will win the victory. Praise and worship puts a voice to your faith. You need to realize something. Caleb, if you go back in the scripture, was the first one to speak up. They all said something about the fruit. They all said something about the blessing. They all said, and then they said, but we can't do this because the enemy is too good. It's too great for us. But, but Caleb said, whoa, hush. Let's go do it right now. Right now, we can go take what it is that God has promised us. Right now, we can go have victory. I don't need to wait. I don't need to put it off to the side. We can do it right now. He began to give the praise and worship to God. And when he gave the praise and worship to God, the faith built up where he could look through that new pair of shades and say, I don't know how it's going to happen, but I know that God will make it happen. So you ready? Here's the lesson. If you're going to be a Caleb, you got to walk into the house and you got to begin to praise and worship. But pastor, I don't feel like it. You don't understand what I'm going through. Really, it doesn't matter. My, my worship to God is not relegated by what's going on in my life. My circumstance does not dictate my praise. My praise will dictate the outcome of my circumstance. When I start putting my faith in God, things begin to happen. Victories begin to take place. And God said, Caleb, the one that's out of the tribe of Judah, the one that knows how to praise, the one that knows how to worship, I want you to understand, all the rest of you are going to die in this wilderness. But Caleb, Caleb's going on to the promised land. Caleb's going to be in the promised area because he's already got his new pair of shades on. So that was Caleb. Okay? Look at Joshua. You ready? When you start looking back in the tribes and you start looking who daddies and, and how the, the whole chain falls into play. Joshua, his original name before Moses changed it was Oshia. And he was of the tribe of Ephraim, which was one of the two sons of Joseph. Now, you'd have to do the history and know exactly what these names mean. But Ephraim, you ready? He was from the tribe of Ephraim. Ephraim means doubly blessed you, you need to understand what's going on here Caleb was the first one to speak up the first one to speak up was the one that was out of the tribe of praise and worship anybody following me and so when Caleb spoke up first Joshua jumped on board Joshua was from the tribe of Edom he was from, uh, or from Ephraim. He was from the tribe of Ephraim. And when he was from Ephraim, that meant he was doubly blessed. You ready? So when you begin to praise and worship in the middle of the battle, you're going to end up being doubly blessed by the time it's over. I, I don't think you really grab what I'm trying to tell you. There's only two ways to be blessed by God. God blesses us in two different ways. You ready? More than we expected and more than we deserve. We're doubly blessed. 
We're blessed more than we expected, and we're definitely blessed more than we deserve. So Joshua and Caleb, Caleb and Joshua, praise and worship results in double portion blessings that God will pour out on us. Quit letting the devil tell you that you can't do it. Quit letting the enemy tell you that you can't do it. And get your shades off that are telling yourself that you can't do it. And get you a new pair of shades that says, I'm looking through God's word and he's made me a promise. He's made me a promise of a blessing and it's going to come to pass. Stand with me. If God made you a promise and it hasn't come to pass yet, why don't you remember all the times that he has come through and look at the fruit of those promises and realize that if he's done it before, he'll do it again. Get rid of your glasses that are blocking your view. Get rid of your distorted glasses that you can't see clearly on the other side. Get rid of the glasses that are causing you to tell yourself, not the enemy, but causing you to tell yourself, I can't defeat them, they're too big. Because they said we were in our own eyes as grasshoppers. And so if we were like that in our own eyes, surely that's the way that the enemy will see us. What you need to understand is that if the enemy saw you as grasshoppers, what an amazing defeat for all of those giants to get beat up by a bunch of grasshoppers. Even if I am small, the God I serve is much bigger. And it's not me that's going to win the battle. It's him that's going to win the battle. So I'm just going to praise him for what he's already going to do before it ever even happens. I'm going to praise him for the victory before it ever even happens. I got to quit declaring defeat before the battle even starts. Just can't do it. We can't do it. We can't make it. We can't get through this. This problem's too big. We're not going to be able to handle it. We can't do this. We're not able to do it. You look at each other. You look at your spouse and you say, we can't do this. You can't do this. I can't do this. You're, you're not a man. I, you're not a wife. You're not this. You're not that. We can't make it. We can't. Our families are wrecked. We can't do this. We can't make it. We're not. We can't. We can't. We can't. We can't. And the battle hasn't even started yet. When are you going to quit analyzing how to win the victory and just realize that with God, all things are possible? Start trusting in the Lord God Almighty. You ready? Here's the deep thing. Here it is. Here's the real deep stuff. You ready? Here it is. Wait out with me just a little bit. Do you know why he's called the Lord God Almighty? You ready? This is deep. You probably won't see this coming. Get you a new pair of shades. The reason he's called the Lord God Almighty is because he is the Lord God Almighty. And if you're almighty, that means you have all the might. Nobody else has it. Nobody else is stronger. You are the almighty one. Here's what I need you to understand. Pastor, I've been around this for a long time and and I, I just don't know. I, I, I don't know. It just seems like, you know, it just seems like God's not coming through. And it just seems like it's not happening. I, I wish I had some of my elders in the room that would stand up and say, you know what? There was times when I felt like it wasn't going to happen, but God always came through. I wish I had some of my elders like Moses in Deuteronomy 34 and 7 when Moses was 120 years old and died at 120. But look what it said. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural vigor diminished. He never lost sight. He bought him a new pair of shades. And he never had to look back again. He never was lost again. His eyes never diminished and his vigor never left him. At 120 years old, he was still ready to do whatever it is God wanted him to do. Let me help you. Caleb, when he finally went in, he said, I've been young, but I'm old now. He said, but give me my mountain. He didn't want an easy path at his age. He wanted the hardest thing he could go after. But he said, if God brought me here, God can bring me there. And the view from the mountain... Come on. The view from the mountain. I don't want to settle in the valley. I want the mountain top. And the view from the mountain is so much better. 
when you stay with God and you see through his eyes and through his word you will never have to worry about your life because he will always be there to take care of you always be there to take care of you so here's what we're going to do this morning you ready I preached for 38 minutes okay that's with no commercials 38 minutes straight here's what I need you to do this morning I need you to realize that God can do anything. Oh, but we come to church here every Sunday, Pastor. We know God can do anything. No, you don't, because some of you have been doubting some things that are going on in your life. You might say you do, but you don't really believe it. Problem is you're wearing shades like these. Maybe without the mustache, but shades like these that are a little distorted. And, And you're not seeing real clear. And so because you've gotten in the midst of a trial and a situation and a circumstance, you're not seeing real clear and you're beginning to doubt whether God can get you through it or not. Why don't you take those off and set them aside, pick up his word and look through his word and realize that with his eyes, I can see all kinds of things. With his eyes, I can tell that victory is just around the corner. My family, I've been praying for, God's going to come through. My health, I've been praying for, God's going to come through. My children, I've been praying for, God's going to come through. My grandkids, I've been praying for, God's going to come through. My spouse, my my children, my husband, my my wife, my job, my finances, all those things I've been praying about, God's going to come through because I'm going to get me a new pair of shades and realize that if God said it, it's going to happen. I need some folks that will act like Caleb this morning and say, no, we're ready now. We're going to worship now. We're going to praise him now. We're going to get through it now. I'm not about to let the enemy destroy me or tear me down because my God is greater. And then when you get to the other side, you got his partner Joseph there with you, uh, Joshua with you. And when you got Joshua with you, you got a double portion blessing that's coming your way because that's where he came from. So here's what we'll do. We're going to sing. I'm going to open the altars up. And you're going to come down for prayer. If you need the ministry to pray with you, I just want you to put your hand up. Come right here. We're going to pray with you. Doesn't matter what it is. My God, after last Sunday morning, you ought to be able to know God can do anything. I mean, he can touch anything. And so I want you to come down. I want you to claim that promise. Maybe that's the way, why God did it the way he did. He wanted to show you the fruit of the blessing. I want to show you the fruit of the promise last weekend to tell you this weekend, don't ever doubt it. Don't ever worry about it. Just get your shades on like you need to have them on and realize that I'm going to carry you through whatever it is you need to go through. You ready? We're going to open up the altars. I want you to pray with me across the room. Lord, right now, under the precious name of Jesus. God, you've come with us today. God, your presence has rested here today. God, your anointing has rested here today. And God, I'm asking you, Lord, that you would confirm your word, God, right now. God, your word, God, that is so revelatory to us, God. And we see, God, where the promises are, God. And we see, Lord, the promises available to us. But God, I I pray, Lord, that we would get off the distractions, God, and, and get off the things that are distorting our vision, God, and beginning to think that we're not able to make it and we can't do it and we can't defeat and we can't overcome. And God, put us on a new pair, God, of shades that shows through your word that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world God show me through your word that you're never going to leave me and you're never going to forsake me God show me through your word that the victory is given to God already God that you've already won the battle that you already have the victory God put it back in me God put that word back in front of me God that you will carry me through every promise every good gift comes from the father above God your word your word your word in Jesus name altars are open Come down, begin to pray, lift your hands to God and begin to worship, begin to praise Him, begin to magnify Him. Know that He's going to carry you through, He's going to carry you out. Come on, come on, come on, move quick, move quick, y'all act like you're sad in here. Somebody get excited about the fact that God's going to carry me through, God's going to see me through, God's already healed me, God's already touched me, God's already delivered me, God's going to carry me out, God's going to carry me out, let's praise Him.
time, we're going to do this real quick. If you need prayer for an answer, I want you to line up across the front ministry. I need you to move quick. Come on, move quick. You need the prayer for an answer. You don't know what the situation holds. You don't know what's going to happen, but you need prayer. You need prayer for an answer. I know there's some in here because I'm telling you what I feel in the Holy Ghost. You need God to answer something. Just line up right across here, right across the front. We're going to pray for you. We're going to sing. I need those of you that are in the altars just to point your hand this direction and pray. But if you need prayer, you need direction, you need God to help you with a situation, I want you just to be right here. And we're going to believe that God's going to do it right now in the name of Jesus. Just as much authority as we took last weekend over sickness, we're going to take authority over doubt. We're going to take authority over division that the enemy would try to cause. We're going to take authority over it right now. And God is going to answer you. God is going to answer you before it's over. Do you believe that? God's going to answer you. So I need you to make sure I got a clear line. I need to know where we start. We're going to pray. Brother Joe, Brother TJ, you in this line? Okay. Brother DePriest is in it. Sister DePriest, when we're going across, where's it end over here? Where's the last one right here? Backing up, backing up right here. Earl, okay. Stand right over there, Earl. Right here. Okay. I need you to help me pray. Uh, we did this last weekend. It don't require a whole lot. We just put God's word into action. We just demonstrate God's word. You ready? We're going to pray and ask God to touch right now. God, I want you to forgive us first. And then, God, we're going to ask you to answer. Okay? Right now. Begin to pray with me. Those of you that are in the altar, point your hand this way. In the name of Jesus. God, right now, under the authority of your name, under the power that's in the name of Jesus, God, I'm asking you, Lord, to cleanse us. God, anything that's not like you in our lives, God, I'm asking you to cleanse it. God, we're asking that we repent right now. But God, I need an answer. God, I need an answer. God, I'm asking you to touch right now in the name of Jesus. Come on, all across this altar, lift your hands. Ministry, begin to pray right now under the authority of the name of Jesus. Come on, you're going to get an answer. You're going to feel a confirmation in your spirit in the name of Jesus.
just give some instruction before we leave here this morning so that you understand. The way you know when something is an answer from God or that it's the will of God is it's going to line up with three things. Number one, it's going to line up with His Word. God will never confirm something in you that does not line up with His Word. He will not go against His Word. Okay, that's the first thing. Second thing is, it's going to line up with a spiritual authority in your life. Okay, in this case, that's your pastor. If your pastor tells you, I don't think it's the right thing for you, then you don't need to do it. It's got to line up with that. And then the last thing is that confirmation that happens in your spirit. You're going to feel it on the inside. And what you feel is going to line up with spiritual authority in your life and line up with the word of God. And that's how you know you have an answer from God. That's how you know. So don't let anything else distract you. Don't let the devil tell you something that's not true. If it doesn't line up with the word of God, if it don't line up with it, it don't line up with spiritual authority, and it's not confirming what you're feeling right now this morning, then you better be very, very careful. But you know it's God. You know that you know that you know when it lines up with all of those things. And so when we pray one more time, they're going to sing and we're going to pray, those of you that came down, and you're going to ask God to confirm that in you. It lines up with your word. It lines up with spiritual leadership in my life. And it lines up with what I'm feeling in my spirit right now. If what I'm feeling is going against your word or going against leadership in my life, then it's not right. And I got to get it in line with those things. And then God will honor it. It is his will. Okay? So across the altar, just lift your hands. We're going to pray one more time. God, I want you to confirm God in your spirit. God, I felt instruction needed to happen. God, I pray, Lord, right now, God, that you will confirm in your people. God, confirm in those that are here this morning seeking an answer. God, confirm it. Confirm it. Confirm it by your word. God, the vision that we have in your word. God, the spiritual leadership in my life. God, confirm it in my spirit in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Now praise him for it. Praise him for it. God bless you. 5.30 prayer, 6 o'clock church.